Glad you're with us. If you're here for the first time, a special warm welcome to you. And uh, we are going verse by verse through the book of Acts. Tonight we're going to be in chapter 13. So if you have your Bibles, please open up with me to Acts chapter 13. Before we begin, just a quick, quick few announcements. So Christmas is rapidly approaching. Next week we're going to do a Christmas study here. So I know even though you'll, so you'll get a double dose of Christmas if you have a home church. Uh, no doubt there'll be Christmas that Sunday as well. Uh, but we'll take a break from Acts and as the Lord leads, we'll do a Christmas study. Then we have two weeks off because Christmas falls on a Friday and New Year's falls on a Friday. So most of you, I'm sure, have family, they have friends, you might be out of town, whatever the case. So I'm not going to even try and compete um, with those schedules. What we want to do <laughs> is still throw a fellowship at our house. So uh, we were possibly thinking Saturday, I think the 20th is a Saturday? 18th? 19th. 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 Okay. So, um, or, and or, the, the week after Christmas, 28th. Um, like around the 28th. Either way, it'll be at our house, um, so pray about it. Let us kind of know what everyone's schedules are looking like, um, because with two weeks off, I miss you guys. I don't want to go two weeks without seeing my, my family. Um, if Please, two quick things. If you don't have a place to go for Christmas, as I know there's a gentleman here who comes to this study who doesn't, it's gonna, he's going to be all alone, so I said, I found out he spent Thanksgiving by himself, I'm like, unacceptable. So if Christmas is going to be the same, we want to just drag you along somewhere. You could be a witness to my family. Good luck. <laughs> um, but seriously, um, it can be a, a tough time for some people around the holidays if you don't have family, if you don't have a place to go. So you are automatically welcome to come and spend time with us. Um, I also, this week, as I was outside with the dogs, was approached by my neighbor and uh, never really had a chance to talk in depth with this woman, but I almost started crying. I mean, just there's layers and layers of pain and heartache in this family, and it, God really pushed hard on my heart. Um, she, the wife leaves for Florida to go spend like a week to 10 days because she's got some really bad arthritis and they actually recommended one weather is good for you. So she's going to go spend like a week or two down in Florida to help with whatever medical condition she has. Um, so I want to try to do something for this family, um, whether it's just a gift card to Walmart. Um, or shop right or something where you know we come together and say hey we're praying for you we care about you we know you're going through a lot a lot of stuff um, so I'd like to try to meet that need if possible so just pray if you have any ideas I'm totally open um, they're kind of quiet people this was the first time she kind of shared and it was just really cool she came up to me she's like you know you always tell me you're blessed every single time I ask you and she's like you know, that's why I know you'll like you'll pray for us or something like that. So it's cool to just be a witness and a light to that that lady. So anyway, that's it for now. Let's set our hearts. Let's pray. Let's ask the Lord to bless our time together. Heavenly Father, I come before you, Lord, with my family here to study your word. Would you please open it up to us? Would you please feed us, God? We are hungry for you. And while the world outside is just, Lord, they're dead in their trespasses and in their sin. If only they knew what we know. If only they understood how much you love them, Lord. They would want to sit at your feet and be fed as well. Father, in this time, I just pray, God, your Holy Spirit ministers to each and every heart, Lord, as you see this room individually and collectively, God. Some come with some heavy hearts, some come with cheerful hearts. But we all come ready, Lord, to just know you more. Lord, we want to be just like Jesus, especially in this season when it's so easy to give a witness the reason that we have, the hope that we have, 
Because, Jesus, you are that reason for the season. And I just, again, thank you for the mercy and the grace and that sweet night that you, God Almighty, became flesh. Just what an awesome thought that is. That you stooped down from heaven and became one of us. Thank you, Lord, for doing that because it ended in the cross where victory was won over our sin. As you conquered the grave, you destroyed death. So we thank you for all these things, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Acts chapter 13, here we go. It's kind of a long chapter. Um, when you get down uh, to about verse 15, it becomes Saul's first sermon. So I'm just kind of prefacing this because we're not going to go in-depth I mean, you can pull each section and piece out of that. There's a lot of meat there. Um, but it would take probably, like, at least two services to try to teach all of that. So I'm just going to kind of highlight as the Lord laid some things on my heart as I was looking over it. Um, but chapter 13 marks the first missionary journey. So I want to start with a question. Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you've ever done any outside of the country missionary work? Just by show of hands. Okay. Cool. So we have some experienced missionaries. And there's no harm if you haven't. I'm just curious um, if you had. I've, I've done some. Raise your hand if you're interested in doing missionary work. Does that sound cool? Well, let me ask you another question. Are you a born-again Christian? Well, if so, guess what? Those who raise their hands, you automatically have missionary work to do. It's not an option, right? All of us are called to be missionaries. Some stay close to home. Some work at home and some go abroad. But either way, you know, I want to build a sign out of this parking lot that it should say, Entering the Mission Field. I think they have it up at Calvary Chapel, Philadelphia. That as you leave the parking lot, it says you are now entering the mission field. Because it's always a reminder that when we come together and we study God's word, we get all you know, fed up and strengthened and renewed and encouraged. But what do we do with that? If we don't then go feed it to someone else and share, then basically we're just becoming spiritual gluttons. Right? You need to pour out into someone or to some people with the hope that you have, that love of Christ. But here in Acts 13, we pick up in verse 25, and again, it's the first, it's going to change now from Peter, who is the main focal point, and we're going to now deal mostly with Saul and his crew. In, verse, uh, in Acts chapter 13, starting verse 1, says, Now in the church there was at Antioch certain prophets, teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed, laid hands on them, they sent them away. And so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia. And from there they sailed to Cyprus. And before we get into the locations, what do we have going on? The church at Antioch. This is now going to be the central focal point, the main church that we're going to deal with. It's almost like the headquarters that's going to then go out. It's no longer going to be about the church in Jerusalem. If you have a study Bible, I encourage you. This is going to be one of the few times you actually can use the really cool maps in the back of your Bible. Because some cool study Bibles... I'll just kind of show you. It's going to be kind of hard to see. But they map out for you Paul's missionaries' journeys. And I really encourage you to look at it so that these aren't just random cities and random locations. The Holy Spirit specifically is going to lead these people to the metropolitans, to the big cities, because obviously they got a lot of territory to cover. There's a lot of world. They're to go into the whole world and preach the gospel. Well, what better way to plant a church in a big city, 
build, raise a church up, raise up leaders, and then they can do the missionary work to their the smaller cities and the people that they would know, right? That just is what would make sense, and that's is, is eventually that's what you're going to see happen. But they're at the church. There's prophets. It lists a few folks here in verse one. It talks about Barnabas. We've already been introduced to him. If you've been with us, Barnabas, the son of encouragement. Everybody needs a Barnabas, right? How many days in a week or times in a week do you feel down in the dumps? You get beat up by the enemy. And you need someone to come along your side and just kind of be your cheerleader and encourage you. And say, Frank, hang in there. It's going to get better. Daryl, stay the course. Come on, keep fighting the good fight. We all need a Barnabas in our life. You have Simeon, who is also called Niger. This man is, if you remember, when Jesus was carrying the cross and it became too heavy, he drops it and the Roman soldier taps this guy, Simon, on his shoulder, who helped bear the cross. That's this Simeon right here. You have Lucius of Cyrene. No doubt, uh, Simeon or, is probably a good friend of his. Simeon probably witnessed to this guy, Lucius, because they're of the same area. Then it's interesting because it mentions this Menean who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. And if you have any familiarity, I just probably butchered that word, but if you have any understanding of the Herods, if you've been following long, they're just, <laughs> they're not the nicest family in the world. Starting back, you know, when in Jesus' day, you know, King Herod had the babies killed and, and so on and so forth. One had the head of John the Baptist cut off. But isn't it amazing and isn't it awesome that despite what people grow up with, despite knowing nothing but murder and chaos and just craziness, here we have a Herod who is now part of the church. He's saved. In love with the Lord. So even if you come from a very broken family, I want to encourage you. Listen, God's grace can extend even to the Herods in your family. And, I, and the last guy that we're introduced to is my man Saul. Now, the last time uh, that really we encountered Saul was on the Damascus Road. You remember his conversion. This is close to 14 years ago. But Saul is back on the picture. And it says in verse 2, as they ministered, now take note, they ministered to the Lord. Isn't that interesting? They didn't minister for the Lord. They ministered to the Lord. Now, why do I just draw that to your attention? Because as you read through the rest of the verse, they ministered to the Lord, they fasted. And the Holy Spirit said, now separate me and Barnabas and saw for the work to which I called them. So you have worship and you have works. And there are always and have to be both in your life. Because guess what? If you only have worship, but you have no works, well, you have this religious form, but there's no power in it. Because all you do is say, yeah, I go to church. Yeah, I believe. I worship God. But then you don't do anything else for him at all. You're a pubertator, as some pastors like to say. There's no works. There should be something that God puts on your heart to do for him. Because let me tell you, if you worship him with all of your heart, I guarantee he's going to say, Hey, i got a work for you to do. I want you to go minister to that person. I want you to be part of this ministry. I want you, I want you, I want you. God always wants you. And you miss out on that one where there's no works. And if it's reversed, <laughs> if all you do is work, because some people think, oh, I get to heaven because of my works. Some people think, oh, I get better favor with the Lord if I work. So I'm just going to work, 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 work. But there's no worship. Then it's all in your own power. It's all about you. And it becomes a self-centered form of religiosity. Does that make sense? So you need a balance. You need both works and worships to go together. Not only that, but I want you to take note because take note in verse 2, in two it says there is the work that he's called. But in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, just flip over there real quick with me. And no doubt Saul, who's going to become Paul, which we're going to get to in a little bit.
in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. You want to highlight this verse. It says, for we are his workmanship, his poema in the Greek. That's where you get the word poetry from. We are his workmanship <coughs> created in Christ Jesus. That's you and me. Anyone who's been born again, you are created for Jesus Christ. Why? For good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The best part I love about being a Christian is figuring out what these works are. And he doesn't give it to you all at once. You go through seasons of life where the works change. He gives you a different set of instructions. Every day when we wake up, it should be, Lord, what would you have me do today? What's in store? And some days it'll be, you know what, Jim? I just want you to pray. I just want you to pray. Some days, be, hey, I want you to share. Some days, hey, I want you to teach. Dads, hey, I want you to love your wife today. Wives, I want you to respect your husbands. Or vice versa. Probably just mix them up. But whatever your work is, God has an ordained works for you to do. What are you doing? Are you working for the Lord? And again, there are works we do because we love them. They don't get us, like, again, in with God. Some people look at me and they think, Jim, oh, you know, because you're doing this. You, God really loves you. He'll listen to your prayers more than mine. No, that's not the case. He loves us all the same. But we should be busy about his kingdom. Back in Acts chapter 13, it says, verse 3, Then having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit... Here we go. They went down to Seleucia. Now, that's about a 16-mile journey. Again, if you have your maps, you can look at it later. It's about a 16-mile walk just to get to this kind of port city because from here, they're going to sail to Cyprus. We take it for granted this day and age because guess what? We turn the key 16 miles in our fast Mercedes Benz. Guess what? No problem. When was the last time somebody here ran 16 miles? Notice there's not a large show of hands. And I don't blame you. I can't remember the last time I put 16 miles close together on my feet. If I'm lucky, I get on a treadmill and run too. But this is just to get to, just to, get to the boat. We take this for granted that these people, you know, didn't have chariots. <laughs> they walked or they rode a, an animal of some kind to get there. But from Seleucia, they sail to Cyprus. Why Cyprus, you might ask? Well, if you remember or know, it's Barnabas' hometown. So, hey, Barney, where should we go? Where should our first missionary trip go? Guys, you got to come to my place. My family's not saved. There's a ton of people that... I know maybe they'll listen to you more than me. And, and it just speaks to my heart. And I wasn't kidding. Hey, if you have nothing to do with Christmas, please come to my house because my family's done hearing Jesus from my mouth. So your Cyprus could be my, at my, my parents' house where then you get to share the good news. Just saying. <laughs> but I'm sure we all can relate, right? Sometimes it helps hearing from another Christian. Don't give up on your family if they're not saved because they don't want to hear it anymore from you. Just bring your, your crew with you. <laughs> but in Cyprus, this is, the, this is the ideal and perfect missionary journey for you rookies. Why? Because the climate's like that of Hawaii. I wouldn't mind going there, especially in another three weeks. We're all going to be crying how cold it is. Man, but ask me to go plant a church in Hawaii... I'll hand this pulpit off to any one of you. Goodbye. Here we come, Hawaii. Aloha. Give me my son and my surf. But that's where they're headed. Beautiful climate. Pretty packed out island. But despite the beautiful climate, despite the beautiful weather and the people there, there's some interesting things that you need to know about the history of Cyprus. So number one... And most importantly, it was known for its worship of Venus or Aphrodite, the love god. Every woman, listen, 
Every woman on that island was required at some point to become part of that worship. They were to become a temple prostitute. And the moral depravity of that island, when you read about it in history, it was just so full of disease, debauchery. It's such a tragedy. You know, and it's, it kind of hit home and when I just sat thinking, when you think of our culture today, especially you folks who are, you know, my age or older, as you've watched the morality of our nation, it's gotten so bad that now you can't even watch, like, a, you, I'm afraid to watch a PG movie for what's going to come up in it. And everything, I remember clearly, like, when my grandparents are alive, they would, they'd be, well, they'd be tripping out if they knew what was going on, what people accepted and endorsed morality. I mean, even if, when we love football, we have fun, we watch football games, but you have to turn the TV off when the commercials come because these half-naked ladies come out soliciting you beer, soliciting you cars, whatever the case is. There's just, that's what, I mean, this is just the tip of the iceberg. I don't need to address this. Not to mention, now we have an even worse problem in our country, in the world today, and it's sex slavery. Women that are being driven into this, forced to prostitute themselves. You guys, this is not uh, like a, you know, the Christian thing back in the day. This really hits home. You know, I think of just, you know, you go city to city throughout the country. I mean, how many strip clubs are there? And think about this. Hey, if you're a nightclubber, you get your drink on, you get your fun on, because that's where everyone says, oh, go, just let loose. Live like the Epicurean lifestyle, meaning just live for whatever pleasure feels good. This is the, certainly the day and age we live in. And it's sad. And, and women... And men are just given over to this worship and they don't even know it. They are sold out to Diana and don't even know it. And if you've been part of that worship, that was part of my lifestyle before I became a Christian, let me tell you, those chains can come off. But the interesting and the sad thing, and I want you to listen carefully, is this. Especially you, if you're, and I pray you're, holding off till marriage if you're single, that you're resisting that urge. Because if you take a piece of paper and you glue it to another piece, so if I had a white piece of paper and a black piece of paper and I glued them together, right? When you go to separate those two pieces of paper, what happens? They tear together, don't they? They don't just come apart clean. They rip into pieces. That's what happens to your life when you live a life of fornication. Why? Because people think it's all about the physical, but it's so much more than that. You develop a spiritual bond and tie to that person, even though you may not think you did. And then you just become so engrossed, and then just walking away from that person after you've been immoral with them, it's not always an easy thing. It leaves pain, it leaves hurt, it leaves resentment, it leaves jealousy, it breeds all kinds of other sinful nature. <coughs> That's why I'm beating this horse to its ground, because if you're thinking about being sexually impure, you're being tempted by someone to want to just do those kind of things, man, please, don't do it. Don't, just don't do it. So as they sail... From Seleucia to Cyprus, it's about a 130-mile journey. Again, we just talked about the history. They arrive in, a, in the port city, in the largest city, verse 5, called Salamis. And they preach the word of God in the synagogues to the Jews. And they also had John, their assistant. Now, this John is John Mark. He's the one that's going to write the Gospel of Mark. And... Just as a footnote, the Bible tells us in Colossians 4.10 that he is the cousin of Barnabas. So, nothing like having family and being able to do missionary work together. That's pretty cool. Verse 6, now when they had gone down through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, meaning the son of Jesus, the son of Joshua. And he was with the pro-council, Sergius 
Paulus, an intelligent man. And this man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought, take note, he sought to hear the word of God. So for all the people who say, what about the guy on the island? I bring him to this guy on the island. Because everybody thinks that random guy on the island that exists, that's never heard the word, that's not seeking the word, that can never know the God. Well, here's your guy on the island. Although he probably heard the word being preached and something caught his attention or, you know, however he did. But he sought to hear the word. And I pray that you do too. The word of God is so central and so important to our foundation and our life. But yet in the church today, there's such a lack of biblical teaching. There's such a lack of... A desire to read the word that I don't know that like people just like though they would consider what we're doing this is boring we need to run around the church do some jumping jacks you hear get pumped up in the spirit that's what that's what pe people are looking to be entertained and you know if you know me long enough I love movie quotes sometimes I feel like gladiator and I just want to throw the sword like are you not entertained is this not what you came for when you come to church, when you come to Bible study, do you come because you're hungry for God's word? In my life, let me tell you, when I first became a Christian, it's the only thing that saved me. It's the only thing that kept me from going back out into the world. Because all of the hoopla and the craziness, it didn't do anything for me. I'm like, but I, I, I need to hear from God. I don't hear from God with all of that stuff, where I hear from God is here. And he tells me he loves me, that he has works for me. He's got a plan for my life. And this man, this intelligent man, as the Bible says in verse 7, because something attracted, he wants to hear. He wants to know God's word. And maybe you've been sharing with someone. Maybe it's you yourself where you're finally at the place where I want to know God's word. And what happens when you find that person in that place? Guess who's right hot on your heels? <laughs> the enemy knows. So who does the enemy send in? Verse 8. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them. What was his purpose? To seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. I remember several distinct times witnessing to someone, and then here comes a Jehovah's Witness, and they interrupt the conversation like that. What he's saying is it, right? I wish I could give that Jehovah Witness the same answer that Saul says in verse 9 when he looks at, filled with the Holy Spirit, he looks intently at him and says, Oh, full of deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil. <laughs> I know I can't say that, and I haven't said it. So, but man, when I hear cults talking to people about God, oh, deep down inside, there is like, man, this person is tricking them. They're lying to them. Lord, what should I do? <laughs> what would he say? But notice, you know, because somebody say, well, that's pretty harsh, right? He called them the son of the devil. But this man's purpose, and I still, and again, it lets you recognize that there is a real war out there, is there not, right? Because you would think, why can't just people let me just talk to people about Christians? Why do they get so upset that they feel the need to interrupt and then even try to, you know, disrupt? Because there's, it's a war. When you're sharing Christ with someone, guess what? You are trying, by the grace of God and empowered by the Spirit, you, to lead them to salvation, to see them get saved, and the enemy doesn't want to let loose. So in Saul's case, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. He looks at him, O son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness. Will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you. You shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him and went around, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. I believe Saul would be perfect. I still believe he had a heart, even as harsh as the rebuke was, because if you remember Saul, when he was on the road to Damascus, what happened to him? He too was blinded. He knows what it's like to be led around by the hand. 
And I believe Saul still would have wanted to restore this man and to see him saved. And then in verse 12, the proconsul believed what he saw, what had been done. But take note, he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. It doesn't say he was astonished at the miracle. Why do I bring that to the forefront? Miracles are great, but guess what? God's word is infinitely times better. And I pray that we all develop that astonishment and that desire again to, to want to know the teaching of the Lord. Because this guy's hearing for the first time, God loves me? You mean after all I've done? Jim, you don't know my past. You don't know how wicked a person I was. No, God loves you and he wants to restore you and redeem you and save your soul. He wants to set you right and make you right and then use you. It's the greatest plan going. You get saved, and then you get used by the Lord. That's what you're here for. This guy is so blown away because probably his whole life he's heard that maybe God's mad at him, that God doesn't care about him, that I have to do all of these religious duties and service in order to appease my God, right? Could be any of those. He's astonished at the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and his teaching. Before we move on in verse 9, it's the first time that Saul is going to be called Paul. Saul, interestingly enough, his name means uh, requested one because he was probably named after King Saul right before David. Paul, his name means little. Talk about a humbling experience. I went from being asked for and requested, everybody wants to hear me speak, to just a little. I bring that to your attention because in, Paul, in Paul's ministry early on, okay, in the early part of his ministry, <clears throat> he's small. He says he's the least of the apostles. Midway through his ministry, he's going to say, I'm the least of all the saints. By the end of his ministry, he's going to call himself the chief of sinners. You see, as you grow each and every day in the Lord, I know for me it's a humbling thing, and I am just more ever grateful for what the Lord has done in my life, that now I challenge Paul on being the chief sinner. <laughs> I'm like, man, Paul did some, man, I think I got Paul beat. But as we grow in the grace and the knowledge, it's so loving, it's so humbling, it's so wonderful that you just see just how bad sin is and how holy God is. And I think a lot of us just go through that same process. As we move on in verse 13, now when Paul and part of his party, now they set sail from Paphos and they come to Perga. That's another 175 miles. Again, you can get your maps out. They're going to head north in Pamphylia. And then it says, John departed from them, returning to Jerusalem. So this journey is about 175 <coughs> miles, 100 of which goes from sea level to about 3,600 feet. Who here wants to walk a hundred miles uphill? <laughs> How bad do you want to win some souls for Jesus Christ? Not only that, but this area in Pamphylia, in Galatians chapter 4, 13, we pick up that this is where Paul gets sick because it was, a, it was prone for malaria and other diseases. And no doubt, John Mark leaves because he sees how hard it gets. Not only that, but they just left an island where all we know is one person got saved. Okay, so we sailed all this distance. We talked to all these people, all for one soul. Wonderful. That's like a real success. Now, I bring that to your attention again for two reasons. Even local missionary work is hard. Sometimes this walk with Christ does it not feel like a, a straight uphill, I'm tired, this is hard, I want to just go home. Don't even think about quitting, don't even think about giving up. 
It's always too soon to quit. But I also think that sometimes we have preconceived notions of, okay, I give my life to Jesus Christ. I think it should be like life in Hawaii. Tropical music. I got my orange juice in my sippy glass and I'm lying on my surfboard. <laughs> if you're a Christian for a week, you'll find out that's not the case. Because those waters have sharks in it. The sun burns your skin. And the heat gets to you after a while. Not to mention the mosquitoes. But you get what I'm saying. John departs... We're going to pick up on that in Acts 15 because it causes a huge division between Paul and the group. But for now, they depart. In verse 14, it says, Now when they departed from Ferga, they come to Antioch in Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. Now, it's tricky because you're going to see this word Antioch. There are seven different cities that have that name in it. So you'll need a map to kind of figure out which one that they're talking about. But as it was custom... They went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, verse 15, and after reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them, saying, Men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. So, what a divine opportunity for Saul to strap on his boots and say, Okay, they don't know what's about to hit them. They think that this Saul is a Jew, he's a rabbi, he's going to give some great you know, Old Testament teaching and refresh them in the, in the Jewish ways. <laughs> but God had other plans for them. So, we're going to read, and I'll just kind of interject some minor thoughts as we go through. This is Saul's first, Paul's first sermon. And I want you to remember this too. You can remember when Stephen preached, because the sermon is a lot like Stephen. Before he was stoned, who consented at the death of of Stephen while he was being stoned. It was Saul of Tarsus, our man Paul here. Now why do I bring that to your attention before we start? Because there are people that may reject your message. You may think they don't care about a word that you say. Jim, I shared with them. They rebuked me. They rejected me. And they're still their hardened criminal sinner self. But guess what? Maybe Stephen thought that about this guy Saul. He was consenting. I approve of this death. <clears throat> Kill this guy right now. Stone him. Stephen had no idea 14 years later <laughs> Saul would be on the scene. Now Paul preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. So don't give up and don't stop praying for those who reject you and your message. So he stands up, verse 17. The God of this people, Israel... They chose our fathers and exalted the people, and they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he brought them out of it. He's going to cover some history here. So this is, again, all in the Old Testament. For a time of about 40 years, he put up with their ways in the wilderness. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land to them by allotment. And when he gave them judges for about 450 years until Samuel the prophet... And afterward, they asked for a king. Hence the name requested one. That's why God gave them Saul. God tried to say, you don't need a king. But they wanted a king. They demanded a king. So he's like, okay, you want a king? You don't want to let me rule over you? I'll let this guy come to pass. And he wasn't a good king. And it's verse... 21, so God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David as king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. Please take note of that. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the sweet part, and I just, I just want to touch on this about David's life in case you don't know. David was a good king, but he made a lot of mistakes. He failed miserably at times. He sinned greatly against his God. But the one thing David never did was trade in his God. He never turned away. It's because of his epic sin failures 
that would God would use him to pen some of the most powerful psalms, no doubt that minister to us. Read the psalm, go through the 50s, and read some of the psalms about restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Create in me, Lord, a clean heart. Lord, I've sinned against thee and thee only. You just see what he writes because we've all messed up. We've all fall short. And just when we think we get our act together, we're doing well, guess what? We may sin in a really bad way. And it's in those moments that you can throw in the towel. You can say, I'm done with this Christian life. God's done with me. Or you can be like David and say, no, God, when you died on the cross, you said sin's past, sin's present, sin's future. They're all forgiven. David is your Old Testament picture of the utmost grace that God extends. As long as you stay close to him and worship him, even if you fail, it's okay. And I want to speak to you today because some of us here tonight perhaps have made a lot of mistakes and we hold a lot of guilt we, and we let the enemy condemn us. And you know the difference between conviction and condemnation. Conviction drives you to the Lord. Condemnation drives you away. Conviction brings you to your knees. Condemnation brings you to your feet as you run out the door. Where are you tonight? Is there something that haunts your past that you grieve the Lord, you've hurt him, you, you sin, and you can't forgive? You can't just let the Lord heal and restore you. I want to tell you that's what he wants to do in your life tonight. It says then, in verse 23, from this man's seed, according to the promise, God raised up for Israel a Savior, Yeshua, Jesus. After John first preached before his coming, the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, who do you think I am? Am I not he? But behold, there comes one after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to loose. Take note, men and brethren. Sons of the family of Abraham and those among you who fear God. To you the word of this salvation has been sent. For those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers because they did not know him, nor even the voice of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, have fulfilled them in condemning him. And they found no cause for death in him. They asked Pilate that he should be put to death. Now when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. <clears throat> Hallelujah. He was seen for many days by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses to the people. And we declare to you glad tidings that the promise which was made to the fathers. As a side note, not only those witnesses, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 6, Listen, it says there were 500 witnesses of the resurrected Christ. So if you or anyone that's listening, this is what I encourage you to share. If you were called on to a jury, okay, and here comes the collaboration, there comes the testimony, right? First person walks in, says, you see that guy here with the green shirt, with the chain on his shirt, crew cut hair? That guy is the one that robbed my store. Next guy comes in. See that green guy with the shirt? Yeah, he had a green shirt on. I believe it had a chain on the shirt. Said something about Jesus. Crew cut spiked hair. He robbed my store. If that happened 500 times, would that man, would I go to prison? Absolutely. At, without any equivocations. I'm guilty, right? That's the way our, our court system works. Based on testimony, based on eyewitness and evidence, right? If 500 people said it happened, guess what? I'm, <laughs> I'm doing life. There were 500 people that saw the risen Christ. So when people say, I don't believe in the resurrection, encourage them. Well, but then what can you possibly ever believe in? Do you believe in what your current textbooks say at your school or your science books say? Why? Someone wrote it. How do you know they're telling the truth? You never know anything could be true. But no, you can because you don't want to think that way. There were 500 people in the one instance alone that saw Jesus Christ risen from the dead. 
So if anyone tells you otherwise, you say, well, listen, I got a good company. I got 500 people to one that says you're wrong and Jesus is right. I like those odds, 500 to one, especially when they're in my favor. Right now, the Eagles' odds of winning the Super Bowl are probably 500 to one. And I'm being gracious. <laughs> The Packers are only 300 to 1, so stop your laughing. <laughs> but that's what, that's what Paul is trying to say. I know you weren't there, and many, of us, and many people struggle. I want, Jim, but I need to see it. If only I was there, then I'd believe it. Ah, I don't think you would. There are those <laughs> who were around the risen Christ, Maybe they didn't see it specifically with their eyes, but they talked to the person it happened to. Just like kind of my story, I'll share a quick testimony. I know it's kind of a side note, but you want to talk about spiritual warfare? And you want to talk about just, just the craziness of just life. And again, I know it's totally unrelated, but before we go on, so I witnessed to a Satanist about a week and a half ago. He was at the gym. Saw me doing my Wing Chun drills, so he asked. I said, oh, I gave him a card, Bible study card. And he's like, oh, Jesus. Oh. He's like, Jesus is okay. And then he rolls up and he shows me he's got a tattoo of Satan right on his chest. I didn't even know what to say. It's the first time I've met a real life Satanist. So, oh. Uh, I said, well, Satan can maybe help you in this life, but he can't help you in the next. So... Week later, this Monday, some of you got the call the day after. So he saw me doing my drills again. He approaches me. He says, hey, you do all that fancy kung fu training, but how do you stop a punch like this, a low punch around? So I'm like, okay, I can demonstrate that for you. And as I did, I stopped, and guess what? He then threw as hard and as fast as he could three punches at my face. He tried to knock me unconscious to say... I guess, you know, Christ isn't so good. Your art isn't so good. And I'm telling you, as God is my witness, I think it was an angel who took a, a picture of the moment because all I saw was a flash which started to make me move my head. Otherwise, I wouldn't have even seen the first sucker punch come. And I was able just to get my arms up just to block it. And it's just crazy. I didn't know it's just a wild testimony, probably more related to our sorcerer friend you know, but I'm just like, you know, and talking to this guy, I'm like, you know, you think Satan's better? You really want to worship him? Oh, we have a risen Savior who loves us, who died for us, who did everything he could for us. And now, in verse 33, God is faithful in this. He raised in his children. He's raised up Jesus. And it's also written in the second psalm. You are my son. Today I have begotten to you. And he raised him from the dead no more to return to corruption. He has spoken thus. And he's again quoting some Old Testament psalms here. I will give you the sure mercies of David. Therefore, he also said in another psalm, you will not allow your holy one to see corruption. <clears throat> so real quickly, the first one from verse 33, it says, You are my son, today I have begotten thee. I've heard cults use this all day long to justify that Jesus was created because he was begotten. But in the context, it's of the resurrection. It's not talking about the womb, it's talking about the tomb. So you can throw this on people who say, see, but that's not the context. He was begotten from the dead. Jesus died, like every one of us, unless the rapture come is going to happen. We're all going to physically die, but only Christ got back up. And because if you believe in him, when you die, guess what? You'll get up to the same spirit that lives inside of you. It's all about resurrection. And then again in 34, he says, uh, it's another Psalm 16 that I promise you I will give you the sure mercies of David. And down a little further, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. For David, after he heard his own generation, verse 36, by the will of God, fell asleep, was buried with his fathers, and he saw corruption. But he whom God raised up saw no corruption. 
therefore, anytime you see a therefore, Bible students, you circle it because you have to ask yourself, why is it therefore, right? So you take all of what's been preached from his sermon to say this. This is like, basically, if you're watching, listening to a symphony or, you know, it's with the crescendo, it's the, it's the, where it hits its high note. It's in the movie where the twist is finally revealed and you see who the, the secret agent is or whatever. It says, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins, and by him everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law. Man's greatest need is accomplished with God's greatest deed. Man's greatest need is to be forgiven. And God's greatest deed is the cross and the resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. The law which the Jewish people ab abided by because that was the covenant they lived in. That's what they used. That's what they did. That's how God spoke to them. But every time that an animal was slain for their sin, it was a reminder that they were still stuck in their sin. And they had to follow all of the laws now we come to this dispensation where you and I live under grace because Christ died for it all. He completed it all. And that's why we don't need to sacrifice for our sins. We don't follow all of the laws in the Old Testament because they are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Take note in verse 39. I love it. And you, if you've been in Christianity or in a church long enough, when it says you are justified, this is a big important word. Because many people think that they are going to be good, but when they stand before God and they're just going to give them a piece of their mind that God's going to be okay with who they are and how they are, but that's not the case. To be justified means as just as if you never sinned. That's what the blood of Jesus does for us. Just as if. That's a fancy word, justified. It's what makes you right before God. So when you stand before him, if someone says, and you want to question them, you don't know where they're going when they die, you ask them, how do you know you're going to heaven? It's got to be by the blood. It's the only way. If they give you any other reason why they think that God's going to let him into heaven, they are absolutely wrong, according to what Jesus says, according to what the scripture says. There's only one Thing that makes us right before God it's his blood accepting his atonement for our sins and why does it it's so put perfectly in his message because now and Paul probably knowing he says take note in 40 beware be on guard be careful therefore lest that what has been spoken in the prophets comes upon you behold you despisers listen to this prophecy from Habakkuk Behold, you despisers, marvel and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which will by no means believe. You will no means believe, though one were to declare it to you. The Jewish people missed the greatest thing, and people tried to tell them. Has anyone ever tried to tell you something so good you refuse to believe them? Why did you doubt Maybe they were telling the truth. What would have convinced you that they were telling you the truth? If I said, hey, and I lay this gauntlet down, I know the best, best burger place. I guarantee if you come with me, I will take you to a place that when you take a bite into that burger, you will say, Jim, this is the greatest burger I've ever eaten. Mark my words, I've had three people go and three people come out saying it. Three for three. Who's next? So when I tell people that Jesus is the only way and he is perfect and holy and he loves you, listen, despite him being raised from the dead, despite people saying, I saw this guy, he was crucified, I saw him killed, and now that same Christ spoke to me. That should be enough that people should just be like, man, how do I become a Christian? How do I get saved? But isn't it interesting that God even writes to those people that doubt. Listen, there's going to come a time and a place when someone's going to talk to you about the greatest news ever. And you're still not going to believe it. And I told you that was going to happen. 
So you take him to this verse and be like, you don't believe? Well, look, God told me you weren't going to believe, even if I declared it to you. It's written right here. Do you want to believe now? You get it? Because it's all about his love. It's about his grace. Again, our need, God's greatest deed. Time is just about up. But here's just where I want to end. I'm going to end with verse 43. So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged those words that they might be preached to them the next Sabbath. So as custom, it went to the Jew first and now to the Gentiles. And now when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Now I have that highlighted. Why? Because Paul is going to write Galatians not too long and... These people who were supposed to continue in grace, they didn't. When you read Galatians, it's about these people who started in the spirit and tried to finish in the flesh. They started with grace, but then it became Jesus and the law. It became a mixture, and Paul had to rebuke them. So much so that Paul writes that if any other gospel is preached, other than grace and grace alone, let that person be eternally cursed and damned. He says, don't let any person preach a gospel to you, or if an angel preaches a gospel to you. That rings true for Islam, because how did the Quran start? Muhammad heard from an angel. Another gospel. On the Book of the Mormons, it says another testament. Do you know that? Take them to Galatians and show them, if you preach another gospel, you are in serious jeopardy. I didn't write the book, but that's what Jesus says. That's what Paul says. To continue in grace. Oh, and oh, that we would. We don't use it as a license to sin. We don't say, okay, I'm going to start getting drunk. I'm going to start fornicating. I'm going to start doing all this stuff because God will just forgive me. That's not grace. It's not a license to go do what you want. Again, we started with worship. And the works that accompany our worship, if you're in just the right mode and you understand his grace, you want to serve the Lord and you want to love the Lord and you want to please the Lord. Jim, when you do that, how do you repent? We'll talk about it right after. Okay. okay. So, read it to the end of the chapter on your own. It's just a couple of verses. We're going to pick up in three weeks. Because, like I said, next week we're going to do a Christmas study. Then we have two weeks off. And then we'll be back in Acts 14. But let's close in prayer, okay? Heavenly Father, I just thank you for your word. Oh, it's so wonderful, Lord, and how it just ministers to our hearts. Lord, we thank you for grace because you give us a ch time and time again a chance to constantly just redo and redo, Lord. We want to do this life right. We do want to please you, but we know, Lord, that you love us nonetheless. Your arms are always stretched out, open wide, to forgive and to cleanse, to renew and to restore. Father, I pray over those here tonight, those who need that kind of forgiveness and restoration, Lord, would you meet them in their life, in their hearts right now, God. You've seen all of our sin <laughs> that we've committed during the week, but you love us and you forgive us. And 1 John, in the, in the first chapter, verse 9, says that if we confess our sins, you, Jesus, are faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. It's the Christian bar of soap. Thank you for always being so gracious to forgive us and for your great love for us. And as we fellowship and Lord, as we go about the rest of our weekend and into next week, I pray that you would use us to be missionaries, Lord, here in our hometowns, our home cities, wherever you send us. Give us open doors. Lead us to these Roman proconsuls, as it were, who are seeking to hear the truth. Lord, people are searching. I know they are. And let us be ready to teach them and show them the word of God that tells them that God has a plan for their life and he loves them and cares for them and he died for them. We thank you for these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.